Hello everybody, welcome to this month's Footsteps to Mars Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell and I run the Deep Astronomy website and YouTube channel and today, this month, Harley has set up another really interesting hangout for us. Today we're going to be talking about the, uh, pl the issue of planetary contamination and protection, especially as it affects or as it works on our uh, efforts to get to Mars. So uh, I'm really excited about today. I think we've got a lot of good things to talk about and I'll introduce our guests in just a minute. But first I have to introduce my co-host. Joining me as he do most months, uh, it, well actually Harley joins me every month. So I'm going to go ahead, every month is Dr. Harley Thronson, wow. who's a senior astronomer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Hi Harley and welcome back. Hey, good afternoon, Johnny. Hi, also joining me when he can. He's not jetting around the world or hey, hi, hi. driving in his car. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, Dr. Alberto Conti. He is the uh, innovation scientist and a bunch of other things at the Northrop Grumman Corporation, where the the people who are building the James Webb Space Telescope. And he's uh, he's back also. So hi, how you doing, Alberto? Hey, I'm great. Great to be here. So Tom. you're not you're not jetting around. This is actually your. No, this is the inside on my on my plane. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm at home today. Yes. <laughs> well, you've got a nicely appointed plane. You've also got a lot of cool toys in there. I'm going to ask yeah, you to no play kidding. with here in just a minute. Okay, so as uh, as I pointed out just a while ago, this is a monthly hangout where we explore different topics on getting us to Mars. Not just um, the rovers and the and the uh, ro remote spacecraft, but also human beings. We where we are working. A lot of people are working at NASA on getting us to Mars in the 2030s. And there's a lot of issues, and so these hangouts are designed to help you understand some of the challenges facing us as we get to Mars, as well as uh, some of the uh, uh, vehicles, designs, things like that are, that are going on. And this week, like I said, our topic is planetary protection, something that people have been worrying about since the very first Viking lander went out in the mid-70s, 1976, I guess it was. Uh, they were worried about contamination on Mars, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But this is a hangout. This is a social media event, so we want you to participate. And they're, the best way to do it is to Go to YouTube uh, that you're watching. Go to the YouTube watch page that you uh, may be watching this on, and interact with us in the live chat. I've got the live chat window up, and I'm looking at your questions and comments already. I see quite a few. Some some favorites here. Andrew Planet is back. Thanks for thanks for showing up again, Andrew. It's good to see you again. George Caldwell is back, taking a break from GCSEs, which. I know it can be very uh, challenging, so I'm glad you're back. Also, uh, Galaxia and Woot is back. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for showing up, Woot. It's good to see you again. So we've got a lot of our regulars here, so it's the best way to interact. Also, though, you can do the footsteps to Mars hashtag on Twitter. I'm looking at that as well. So um, another one. I keep threatening to put up a uh, Gmail, an email list, but I haven't ever done it. So for now, these are the best ways to do it. Uh, okay, so before we get started uh, with the Hangout uh, proper, a couple of announcements. I'm going to uh, let Harley do one of them. Next week, if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, is something extremely interesting. Uh, it's called the Humans to Mars. Is it a workshop, Harley? It's called the Humans to Mars Summit. Uh, Summit, it brings that's what it was. Together, yeah, exactly. It brings together leaders in... Uh, a variety of aspects of human and robotic exploration of Mars, from media folk, uh, the uh, oh Harley, I lost Harley. Does he seem being a little bit uh, pixelated to you guys? Yes. Okay, yeah, Harley, your connection's not great. Okay, You're I'll. I'll try and take care of it. That's all right. Well, we can hear you fine now. Go ahead and continue. Okay. So, uh, sounds fine. So, um, uh, uh, leaders at, within NASA, within the um, uh, private sector uh, aerospace industry that are interested in exploring Mars, senior scientists for two and a half days discussing various aspects of human and robotic exploration of Mars. For it is uh, not only can folks are totally welcome to site, uh, but also it is, um, it is streamed around the world to find it, look at the, or uh, find the Explore Mars Incorporated website. They will list a number of the activities that the Explore Mars Incorporated folks look at. There you go. And look for the Human to Mars Summit. 
find out all kinds of information about the content, the presenters, um, how to attend, um, how to attend it live. It's over at the George Washington University, over at the U George Washington University, or how to view it um, online. Yeah, so what's really cool, I have it up here on my screen share, folks, and it's h2m.exploremars.org. It's happening the 17th to the 19th, and they've got a really cool website, I'll say that. Um, and uh, you can also, though a lot of it will be webcast live, uh, which is, I think, really nice. Um, but you can also go live. Now, they've got some real, here's here's my favorite part. If you go here, look at this. They've got Buzz Aldrin there. They've got all these really cool people. And the rear. Yep. And here we're, we're going to we have yep. um yep we ha we're having on uh on the morning of May 18th it's just one example we have a local um a reporter Joel Achenbach will be having a conversation an interview with Andy Weir. Awesome. Great. So, so there you go. It's a real, really cool lineup. It's uh, in, it's in the, it's at George Washington University. So I would highly recommend uh, anybody in the area checking it out. I'll be watching it live since I can't see it. Uh, myself, I won't be able to do it there myself, but I will be in Baltimore next week. Unfortunately, I won't be able there to see it when that's going on. So check that out. Humans to Mars uh, on their way. Learn about all the new latest stuff. And also this week at the Goddard Space <laughs> Flight Center, as Alberto is already getting queued up for us, a thing happened today or this week with the James Webb Space Telescope. Why don't you tell us a little something about it there? Yeah, Robert. it's a great milestone before we go back to Mars. It's an <clears throat> unbelievable milestone. So the, the telescope mirror that you can see here in this YouTube video, you can actually just uh, search for time-lapse uh, tilting of James Webb. The telescope was tilted upward, and before it was tilted tilted uh, down uh, because what's going to happen is that uh, we're going to put the instruments back uh, on the back of the mirror that you see here. So the mirror here is uh, is very large. It's a six and a half meter mirror. Let me see if I can actually uh, show you the image of uh, John Mather. Yeah, you've got some selfies there to show us too. Yeah, there's some selfies there. Let me see if I can. Okay. Where's John? Here we go. Here's John. <clears throat> there we go. <laughs> so, so this is John Matter, Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Prize winner. He, he actually drew a, a very uh, a similar sketch to what JWST looks like uh, in 1995 on a napkin, and now he's standing in front of it about 20 years later. So, and all we, we, many of the people actually in, reflected in the mirror are actually uh, are actually folks that work with us, and we know them very well. They're folks that do social media. So it was a great event. Um, it was a great milestone, and uh, the telescope was exposed for just. Uh, a day or two, and we're tilting it, and it's coated with gold, and it's just beautiful. I don't know what else to say. You, you just go online. It's, kind of a, it's unbelievable. It's, now, John Mather is the program project scientist. The project Goddard, scientist. Or, He's yes. in charge of the project, basically, right? From the science side, yes. Right, and so he won a Nobel Prize in physics for his work on the um, the cosmic the, microwave background. That's right. The mac the microwave background. Uh, uh, Explorer missions, so the, the data that came from that. So, uh, right. So it's um, it's it's really an exciting time. Another milestone for JWST. They had these um, covers on the the mirror segments, but they were loosely placed on there. They were just designed to protect it uh, from obvious big damage. But when they took them off, they would they would have fallen off if they hadn't have, uh, yeah. you know, removed them before they tilted it. So Alberto, they're putting the is it the ISOM package on the back now? Yeah, so actually, I don't know if you can see. Let me see if I can pull this. There's one last picture, then we go to the to the hangar. But so if you see this uh, on the on the upper left side, you see a, a box there. There are two people right sitting by them, by there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that is all the instruments, all the camera, the spectrographs. And that will be basically inserted in the back of the, of the telescope uh, over the next uh, few months or so. Uh, and right now, if you go to jwst.nasa.gov, you can actually see a live image of where this telescope looks like. It's actually... The mirrors are pointing downward, so you can't really see them. And they are at the top of the screen. They will be at the top of the screen in, in this particular picture. So they're going to integrate the mirrors, and they're going to form a new acronym. So um, OTE for optical um, optical telescope element is the mirror itself. ISIM is the instrument module. They're going to combine them together, and NASA loves acronyms, so do we, and we're going to call it OTIS. O -T -I -S. OTIS. So, ah, yeah, the new... So, so OTIS, crypto. yes. Oh, okay. So Otis. Integration is taking place. So after that, yeah. Otis is ready. Well, you got to tell us what it means. Well, you guys can't just say acronyms. Optical what? telescope 
Instrument uh, assembly. Instrument assembly, yeah. There you go. So, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Instrument yeah. system, I don't know. It's something, it's just <laughs> slapped together two acronyms. But the bottom line is that after this, the telescope, basically the portion of the optical system of the telescope and the instruments are integrated together. It really starts to look like a telescope, and we're going to ship the, uh, all of the all, all that you see basically in this room. We're going to ship it to Johnson Space Flight Center next year, where they're going to run an end to end test. So we're going to shine uh, light and figure out if all the instrument work is expected if the mirror's focus is expected. So it's a big, big deal. Awesome. Well, this is a big milestone this, this week uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope mission. It is scheduled for launch October 2018, right, Alberto? Absolutely. Still everything holding to that uh, to that to launch. Absolutely. Everything is going good. great. So everything is still on track and on, on online for that to happen. So that's really good news. So that's exciting. Now the gold mirror, it's got like a one atom thick or something like that gold coating on the yeah. top, which is highly reflective in the infrared. So it's going to be a great telescope when it's launched. So thanks, Alberto. Okay, so let's get to today's hangout. I have some great guests here tonight to talk to us about planetary protection or planetary contamination. Now, at, from a layman's perspective, which is me, um, I didn't really give much thought about this, but I guess somebody has to, and, and people have been thinking about it for quite a while. We're looking for life elsewhere in the universe. What we don't want to do is go somewhere to another planet, bring our own selves there full of our own germs, and go, oh, look, we found some life, and go, oh, no, never mind. Um, we kind of messed it up by bringing our own stuff. So so we don't want that, and so great pains, and a lot of very smart people are thinking about ways to protect us from that sort of false positive, as well as also the implications of what that means. And so to joining me today uh, are two people whom I'm very excited to talk to, Dr. Betty Siegel. She's uh, from NASA HQ, and also uh, Dr. Jennifer uh Stern from NASA's Goddard. I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself. Betty, let's start with you. Tell us what you're doing at HQ and what your job is. So hello, good morning, I and mean, good afternoon. I'm Betty Siegel. I'm at headquarters. I'm a biophysicist at, at NASA headquarters, and one of my jobs is to work on planetary protection for human missions to Mars. And so I work very closely with Dr. Cassie Con um, Conley, who is the chief Planetary Protection Officer. Great. And, uh, and Jennifer? Or Jen? Hi, I'm Jen Stern. I'm at NASA Goddard, and I'm a planetary geochemist. And so um, I study the atmosphere and the surface of planets. In particular, I'm involved in uh, the Curiosity <coughs> rover mission um, that's at Mars now. Um, Goddard has an instrument called Sample Analysis at Mars that is looking for organic molecules and other geochemical signatures that may or may not have indicated whether life um, could have ever been pleasant, uh, present on that planet. Um, and as a, a general scientific interest, you know, there's so many places in the solar system uh, where we can look for life. So definitely interest in Europa, Enceladus, and other of the, the icy planets as well. Exactly. Well, I want to get to some of those points here as we get along, but, but let's get a little bit of a, of a background on the topic itself. So we're talking again about planetary protection and contamination, and for the focus of this hangout, I'm, we're mostly interested in Mars, but of course, as Jen points out, there's other bodies that, that can also that we also uh, are affected by this. So, Betty, can I start with you? Um, give us some, first of all, tell us a little bit about what we mean by this planetary protection and what sort of... Uh, there's these things called protocols, and I've got a slide here I can show of them as well if you want, but uh, tell us a little bit about, give us some background here. So um, planetary protection has been, um, there's a policy that's been developed through COSPAR, which is the Committee on Space Research. It's an international group, and we've been following that for a very long time, and actually you, um, one of you said that it started with Viking, but it started during our Apollo missions, that we were concerned that we wouldn't bring microbes to the to the moon, and we wouldn't bring any microbes back. Oh, when of the course, first that was me that said that. Yeah, 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 you're right. That because was you remember that. they were quarantined when they came back for three weeks. This was only done for the first several missions, but after a while, we realized that they weren't bringing any microbes back, and we weren't really going to bring any microbes there that could last, and so they stopped the quarantine. So what we're talking about is that we don't want to bring microbes with us on a mission to Mars, especially since we think there could be life on Mars that, or 
some life there or some that from ancient times or currently that we don't want to bring our microbes that would overrun Mars or we'd, we wouldn't be able to study what is currently there. And we also want to protect the Earth. If there are any microbes there, we don't want to bring them back with us to the Earth. Okay, good. And what? The protocols um, that you're talking about, there's several categories of missions and they have to follow different protocols. So, if, for example, if you're going to Mars and you're just going to orbit Mars, it's a different protocol than if you're going to land on Mars with a human. Well, that's a good point. That's, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. So, Jen, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, no, um, no. I just am aware that uh, the protocol depends on you know where you're going on the planet, whether there's maybe the presence of liquid water, um, and as Betty said, it has to do with um, you know an orbiter versus a lander may have very different protocols associated with it. Okay, so as you were working on the, so you're saying that because you worked on Curiosity, you had a different set of guidelines that you worked with versus what, say, someone who may be doing uh, just an orbiter would have to work on, right? It would be two different levels of contamination requirements. Yes, and it also depends on whether the investigation is directly looking for life um, mm -hmm. on other planets. And um, Curiosity was not a life detection mission. It was, we call it a habit habitability characterization. So we don't have... Um, life detection equipment on Curiosity um, and we're also in an area, we landed in an area where there is not likely to be any ice um, so we had different protocols for example than Phoenix would have. Um, Phoenix was the mission, uh, was a lander on Mars in 2009 and uh, that was further north and they did actually encounter ice so I don't know the details behind the protocol but I do know and Betty can um, you know, confirm this, that this must have was a different class of mission, I imagine. Yeah, but regardless of whether the mission is for the life detecting one or not, don't you need to take really stringent methods? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean there's a baseline of methods that, that have to be, have to be um, carried out in order to ensure you're not bringing spores, in order for, to ensure you're not bringing even even not life, but organic molecules. I mean, we are trying to detect organic molecules. We don't want to bring, um, you know, everything you have. You have fuel, um, fuel ha like hydrazine. Um, there are different different things that we bring with us, um, and usually we can characterize them chemically, um, even if they're not biology. We're still interested in organic molecules because that's also what we're looking for. Oh, that's a good point. So, yeah, all these hydrocarbons and things that we might be bringing along with us could definitely contaminate the results, I suppose. Well, I mean, the, the, the idea is there's this very careful characterization um, of what, you know, how much, there, how much we would bring, and there's limits to that. And, um, I mean, it's, it's as controlled as you can be. We're, we're measuring, we, we can measure things so well, um, and we know what we're looking for, uh, it, what we, we know what we bring with us, so we know what that looks like, and we can distinguish that, we believe, from what we see uh, on the surface of Mars. Okay. Well, Jen, let me ask you real quick. This one, I got a question from Andrew Planet. This is a little bit. This is very relevant to what we're discussing right now. He's asking: Were original missions to Mars as strict as on biological contamination as later ones? Has anything changed? I mean, are we still being as strict as we always have been? I think I'm going to defer that to Betty. I think. Oh, she okay, can Betty, go ahead. <laughs> can you comment on that first? <laughs> It's always no, hard to know, know which one that is. I'm not sure, so sure I, understand, I know the difference. I know we have better techniques of measuring the levels of, of microbes, and we may have better techniques of sterilization, but I really personally don't know how strict they were when we did Viking missions. I work I, mostly on planning for a human mission to Mars, and for that mission, we cannot, there are... Um, protocols of what to do for a robotic mission, which is what Jen is referring to. For a human mission, there's a policy, which is COSPAR, that we're trying to follow, which would be that there are special regions, which is again what Jen was talking about, where you might expect that there might be life or precursors of life, for example, where there might be water. And human missions might want to try to avoid those areas those we'd want to keep as pristine as possible. And then there might be other areas on Mars that we call safe areas where humans can land and develop and then maybe they would do either surgeons 
to those other areas or robotic or operate robots to those other areas. Okay, so let's go back to this co what's it called? COSPAR, you said? COSPAR, yes. Co and this is we this research. research this is this research council or group that is in charge of making building these protocols, correct? They it's an international group and they right, have developed a policy of which the US has NASA has agreed to. However for the um, robotic missions, from that policy, they develop what we call NASA procedural requirements. And so there's a document that people who are doing robotic missions must follow, and it very clearly lays out what kind of mission you've got and what kind of protocols you have to follow. We don't have that right now for a human mission, and um, we, we have been asked to develop one, and we've uh, set up a group in order to do that. So we have a group that works it's members of the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, members of the Science Mission Directorate, me members from the Chief Scientist's Office, members from the Chief Planetary Protection Office, and um, the Chief Health and Medical Officer as well. So we have a group that's looking at this, trying to develop these requirements. But at the moment, we don't have enough information to do that. Okay. Well, you were mentioning. So that's a. Let's, let's follow this on a little bit further. Then. So you're saying that the this group has got a, a set of protocols that robotic missions follow, and you're developing one now for human missions. Are you using as a starting point? Uh, we. I mean, we've we've got the moon, I guess, to go on, right? You mentioned earlier that we took precautions when we went to the moon and and, and brought astronauts home. Where do you start with something like this for Mars? Well, again, so we have the policy that's written for human missions to Mars through Coast Bar. There is this policy that NASA has agreed to. Oh, I thought you said you were developing that. I'm sorry. Policy. And we also base it on what we've learned with the robotic missions. And part of this policy for human missions is what I was saying. There would be safe areas, areas that we would hope that humans would not contaminate because we think that there might be life there or in, or in the past life there, and we want to be able to study that. And then there are other areas that we would say are safe for humans to go. Okay, so, okay, so the, the comparison between the two is, is, is a little bit uh, uh, different. I, I get that. I want to go into a little bit more of the differences. So with, with Jen, when you were, when you were you're working on the Curiosity mission uh, and there's other robotic missions out there, what specifically did you guys do to ensure when we sent Curiosity out there and all of its paraphernalia that went with it, the parachutes and all the others, what did you guys do to ensure that it was uh, ready to go, that it wouldn't contaminate Mars? Well, the details, I, I'm not really in... Well, in give us an example, I guess. But for example, like the yeah. instruments, they get baked out. And to, to go back to the question uh, before this about other Mars missions, Viking was also held to very high standards of um, cleanliness and was baked out, was cleaned with solvents, and then also baked out um, to, I'm, I'm not sure what temperature exactly, but the idea is to bake it out at a temperature where you're killing stuff, but you're not going to hurt, you know, the, the equipment, instruments. Right. the instruments. So usually it uh, has to do with, with the temperatures it's, it's um, exposed to, and um, everything, like, there's a clean, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of this work obviously goes on in a clean room. Um, and different clean rooms have different classes of cleaning. Like we just components. saw with JWST. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, so there's so much of, of that work uh, that goes on in a clean room. And, and one of the difficult things, with, especially with, with uh, the instruments themselves, is you, you run them through these tests, you know, make sure everything's looking good, and then you, the final step is to bake them out. Um, and then you, know, you do some nominal testing after that. But if something's wrong, then you have to go in there, and each time you go in there to do something, to fix something, you recontaminate. So you have to rebake out um, the instrument. Um, so, so most. That, so you so really got to get it heat. right the first time if you can. Yeah, you got to try. I mean, um, it, it happens, and and they, but they, you know, they do not sacrifice. You, you know, it, it takes more time, but um, cleanliness is is really obviously important in particular because we are looking for uh, things like hydrocarbons. Um, and things that are very common on on this planet. Okay, so Betty, the uh, the I want to go back to the human part here for a sec. Uh, the human protocols that are that we talked about that you said they're being developed at Coast Bar now. Can you give us an example of what that would look like? What are some of the things that a future astronaut to Mars uh, would have to do uh, if they went to one of the 
first of all, you said you already said going to human uh, or certain locations where there should be, you know, where they're not going to contaminate anything is the first step. But once they're there, what should they be doing? Can you give us an example? Well, okay, so before we get there, just to explain, we would have to find other ways. Obviously, we could bake the, you know, the equipment, but you can't bake a human, and human comes with lots of money. <laughs> yeah. So we because would have to good. make right. sure that we have, as much as possible, a closed life support system. And we would also have to make sure what the leakage, we'd need to know what the leakage rates of the spacesuit is. And these are the details that we haven't worked out yet, which is why I said. And, and we need to look for um, new methods of sterilizing um, areas so that baking is not the only one. As we know on Earth, we can use alcohol very often to sterilize things. We can irradiate them to sterilize them. So there are other techniques that you would hope to use before we even go to Mars. Then when we go to Mars, as I said, there might be safe zones that humans can go to where contamination would not be as much of a problem. And then there are other areas that are called special regions that we'd want to keep very pristine. In the safe areas, we might want to bury the waste and we'd have to use sealed containers that would not leak. These are some of the things that we talked about. We held a workshop last March at Ames Research Center, and the report from this workshop we hope to have on our website um, <clears throat> in about a month. And these were um, some of the topics that we developed and talked about, trying to find different ways and make sure we were using the state-of-the-art ways to prevent leakage from spacesuits from the Orion capsule and things like that. That's a good point. So you, I, I, I'm glad you differentiated that. That that there's two basic phases here, isn't there? There's the getting ready to go phase, where you're getting everybody loaded on board, and you want it to be as clean as possible to protect it from anything that probably they might have brought from Earth. And then there's the once you're there phase. How do you keep all the human activity from making things bad? And so uh, that's a big problem. I mean, how long do you guys do you anticipate this might I mean what's the time scale for some for working out I mean you said the reports coming out hopefully very soon on the website what else what's the the basic timeline after that well luckily we're not planning to go to Mars right away right we're talking about the 2030s so we do like you talk to that's right? not you know, some people are more anxious and, than others um, <laughs> so there's more research that needs to be done for example we need to know can microbes um, live on Mars. Right. How long would they live? Can they be under the soil? Because already they're exposed to a very strong radiation environment. And so there's there's some of the um, research that we would like to fund so that we have some of these answers and we don't know them right now. Well on the one hand you guys are doing all this really great research and work to ensure that we don't do this, that, any, any, that you protect the planet as much as you can before we get there. But now I'm starting to wonder, I just, was it this week or last week I'm hearing Elon Musk saying things like, we're going to Mars, you know, right away. I mean, is he is he participating? Is he <laughs> listening to this stuff? Or is he just going to go do what he's going to do? Are you guys worried about that at all? Well, it's my understanding that Elon Musk is actually working quite closely with the Planetary Protection Office at, at NASA headquarters okay. and trying to follow the rules, I believe, for the robotic missions. So he's doing it and building it into his protocols currently. Um, but yes, of course, we worry about it. One of the things is NASA is not a regulatory agency. NASA has procedures and policies, and we hope that people in the commercial um, will in the commercial world will follow them. Um, but right now, we don't ha we cannot enforce that. And I think we are there's a group working with the Department of State, working with um, FAA, to develop protocols to enforce these. That's an interesting point. I never would have thought of that. So yeah, there's a whole different ball of wax if people decide they don't want right. to play the game, right? I've got, a, I've got a question for Jen. Uh, oh, right, you, Betty, I'd feel free to be in this. And Jen, you've been referring to the special regions on Mars, off-limits regions on Mars. Um, what, what makes them off-limits specifically? What is it about them that, that keeps them off-limits? Well, it's the, the potential for liquid water. And this liquid water is, you know, the perfect solvent um, for 
biology to live in and there can even be you know possibly nutrients dissolved in that water um, but it's basically you know life as we know it needs water so the availability of that water um, is the perfect place that if we were bringing something you know inadvertently um, that air those areas may be contaminated um, and changed and for so you know this announcement earlier this year about discovery of liquid water on Mars um, in these areas called the RSLs. These are the recurring slope lineae and this is these are very briny um, water. So this would be water that's very, very salty. Um, and even on Earth, it's been shown that certain creatures, certain um, biology can tolerate uh, very high amounts of salt. So because we consider this a habitable environment on Earth, we consider it so on Mars, and so it's an area where, you know, it's, it's a sensitive region. It's an area where if you go there, you have to have really the top level um, of preparation and um, decontamination and, and control of what you're bringing. So can, can and I ask that makes it more expensive as well. Go ahead, Alberto. No, I was actually, actually, you know, so I know a lot of work went into all the all the probes that we have on the surface, but is it possible something that we have sent inadvertently survived? And so all I'm asking is, have we contaminated Mars already? Um, I mean, we don't know. There's really, there's really no way to know unless we, you know, canvas uh, all of Mars and see. Um, I, I think, you know, since Viking there has been this effort to you know solvent clean and bake everything out um, but you know that's that's a, that's the toughest question right because <laughs> it's always going to be if we find it you know what will it be and somebody right. has mentioned in the in the question you know could you could use isotopic composition yes, you yes. know or other other ways to distinguish mars life from earth life now that that is a possibility um, because like for example we respire we breathe um, we respire co2 um, and we use carbon, and organisms on Mars would use carbon and also put out carbon. So possibly it might they might have a different isotopic composition because carbon on Mars, in, in Mars atmosphere, has different um, isotopic composition right. than carbon on Earth. So that's one example of a way you might be able to tell. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a really tough question. Yeah, that was from Yurik Mazzino, by the way, who made that comment. So, uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, okay, well... Um, so this this idea of uh, hopefully we haven't already contaminated, but we don't know for sure. Um, the the question of sorry, Tony, I, I don't want to interrupt you. I, the the reason why I asked is that because oh, that yeah, leads to another series of questions, which are, you know, if you if we have or not, it's kind of irrelevant irrelevant at some point. I mean, how do we tell basically, you know, once we are there that this is uh, you know this endogenous to Mars, right? That it belongs to Mars and only Mars, right? Which right. is Another very hard question, right, Jen? Exactly. exactly. Well, that's a problem even here on Earth, though, isn't it, Alberto? I mean, we've you know we've wondered Indeed. ourselves about you know this idea of panspermia and then things coming from from other planets to uh, to maybe you know start life here on Earth. So maybe I think that would be even harder to tell the difference between whether you know it was right. in, what indigenous means. We have to yet I think right, right. I think define. So that's a good point. Um, all right. Well, I so Jen, I know that, or I'm sorry, Betty, I know that you're on the uh, you're, you're working on these these protocols uh, and other countries are presumably you're all agreeing it's all some international agreement right is it a binding agreement or is it just a, a, a handshake uh, what sort of agreement are we talking about here so um, there is this policy and NASA is part of COSPAR and so is most of the other spacefaring nations and they have agreed and signed to it I I'm not a legal expert so I can't tell you if it's totally binding. I do know that NASA feels very strongly that it's committed to it in trying to follow those protocols. Mm -hmm. And um, like I told you, we had a workshop in March um, a year ago that we worked on this from the U.S. point of view. I'm also organizing a workshop, another Coast Bar workshop that will be next October to see if this policy is, is good the way it is currently or we may want to adjust it. Okay. Now, Jen, I'm going to put this thing up you sent uh, before the uh, Hangout started. This is a table that you sent me uh, that lists the uh, different categories of the planetary, it's called a planetary protection table. Can you give us a little bit of background on this? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to mention that this is abstracted 
from NASA's uh, planetary protection. So it's simplified um, because there's actually subcategories as well. Um, but it's at least a first, um, it's a good approximation of the different le different categories. And so you have at the, um, you know, the, the least uh, thing, the least uh, potential of contamination um, would be category one. And as you can see, that's there's when we're going, altogether. yeah, that's when we're going somewhere where there's not likely to be life um, because, you know, chemistry or just physics precludes that. Um, so we don't, we don't, you know, need to be as stringent in our protection. And then as you get, um, and you can see also the mission type, so you have a, a flyby, yeah, and or the top is a flyby, and the, the circle is a, an orbiter, and then you have a lander. Um, so then if you head down to, say, Category 4, um, the Mars rover missions have been in sub-categories of, of here. And so um, the as rover. we... rover? Yep. <laughs> I got a rover, a lander, and um, I guess this is a landing rover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so This would be something that, like, a, a heat shield kind of thing, or yeah. something that broke apart, and you had to jettison at some point, right? Right, right, right. Um, okay. And so, so you, there's some, you know, some granularity here, and you get into these, like I think it's four A and B and C, and that has to do with is it a life detection mission? So are you looking for life? Um, and then, you know, are you going to one of these special regions where there might be water? Um, and so those, it sort of sorts itself out. And then when you get to five. Uh, you, this is when this is a sample return mission. So you know we hope we hope as as scientists uh, in the Mars, Mars science community that we can one day soon bring samples back from Mars, like have samples returned prior to um, humans visiting Mars. We would love to see uh, get a slice of Mars before we can you know further or contaminate it or further contaminate it. Um, and so. These, you know, you have to be super careful on, you know, with the forward and the reverse contamination. Um, and there's all sorts of considerations that, that go into how you would collect a sample, you know, how would it be treated during its return. And in Mars 2020, um, Mars 2020 is the next Mars rover, and there will be a sample cache where um, the rover will pick up, you know, sample and, and save it for later. So some of these considerations um, have come into play. But... You know, I pulled this table from the internet just because it was a, a sort of a simplified way of looking at the considerations that you have to make um, in terms of what kind of protection you need. Now, I know this is a good outline for all the different things you've got to consider in the different categories. Um, so, Betty, what about a return sample mission? Do you guys have you guys uh, put that in your in your protocols too, or is it too soon no, for that? Um, we work jointly with the science mission directorate, so yes, that's part of it. And but and and in looking at that chart again, a human mission to Mars where you're going to return back would be a category five too, where you need to protect um, both forward and backward contamination. Okay, well, good. But what we're asking people to do is, and what we're trying to do within NASA is let people know who are developing the rocket and the crew vehicle, etc., that they need to be aware of planetary protection. And we want them to start thinking this way from the very beginning. So when you're talking about bringing back a sample, say even in, in a human mission, you want to make sure you keep the sample isolated from the crew so that in case there is anything there. So you, know, you need to start thinking this way in the beginning of planning for these missions. And right, there's design that's considerations, why I guess. we have these workshops to um, educate the people that are building them and doing the operations and doing, doing the plans. Yeah, because I can imagine that having huge implications on the design of whatever it is you're going to be sending out uh, and, and then returning back in, in a lot exactly. of cases. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, George, let me see. I'm looking at some of the, uh, some of the questions here. Alberto's copied a couple of them. I think we've asked their... Is there yeah. a chance we've already contaminated it yet? I think uh, we don't. The answer was we don't know. We had, we've done, we're not sure yet. Um, would we not be able to use ISO? You already talked about isotop the isotopic uh, analysis as well. Um, we cannot catalog every Earth microbe, so determining the source would be difficult. Uh, handshake with gloves, of course. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so we. I guess this is this is a complicated problem, isn't it? I mean, you really can't tell. What your you know some of the source of this stuff might be, and I can imagine being a lot of 
careful analysis coming out when we do find any kind of microbes or small bits of, of organic material on Mars uh, that would be heavily, heavily uh, cycled. Are there any tests that we can do that are definitive that say, yes, this is from Mars. We didn't mess it up. It's not contaminated. Is there, is there any so, definitive? I think that um, it's easier to say for extinct life than extant life. Um, so if you find, you know, if we're looking in, you know, curiosity drills into rock. And so what you're getting at in, into is uncontaminated sample. I mean, of course, you still have the drill, but you have very well contaminated, you know, you have it very characterized what the drill could possibly contribute. Um, and you've, con you've um, characterized your entire chain of, of sample analysis. But if you're drilling into a rock, you know, you're you can only assume that that rock has not been drilled into before and so it's the context in which you find this information um, whether it's you know been disturbed or not so and the other thing is you're at you're not just measuring um, you know organics or DNA or something like that you're also measuring other things you're measuring the uh, sometimes the isotopic composition of gases which can be different on Mars than on Earth and so there are it's always, it's never going to be, you know, one smoking gun. It's always going to be contextual um, information that's found along with this in order to understand, okay, this, you know, this organism, this fossil of an organism was interacting with its environment in this way. And we can tell that because we find it in this rock. So a lot of it is context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Okay, well, the so the I'm reading a couple of the comments here. J. Andy Spry is commenting, if we want to exploit Mars, we better not wreck it before we understand it. Elon Musk, Elon Musk should and does care about that. We were just talking about that, so good comment. Uh, Yurik Mazino is asking again, uh, or not asking, he's commenting that China is planning a Mars mission. Uh, I can only hope they follow such protocols. Uh, Betty, how, what, do you have any comments on that? Or is China paying attention? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I don't know about it or not. And like I said, part of this problem is we do need, there isn't a regulatory agency within the U.S., never mind for international. There are policies, there are treaties, people have signed these treaties, um, but I don't know how they're enforced. Yeah, I don't, I don't expect you guys to know the answer to this, but I wonder what that would look like. Would It, it must be a... Un I guess a United Nations thing or maybe a committee on that? I don't know what that would look like. Uh, what do you think, Alberto? You got any opinions on what a international treaty? It had so, to be a treaty of some kind, wouldn't you think? I mean, yeah. I'm, just, I'm, I'm not expecting anybody to know the answer. I'm just trying there, to... There is an international treaty, yeah. but what I'm saying is how they get enforced is a different question. I don't know. So if and somebody goes out there and messes around with it anyway, there's nothing we can really do to punish them, I guess. There, there is actually Margaret Race, I think, in the comment. She pointed out something I was going to mention, which is this, okay. there is a UN committee on the peaceful uses of outer space, mm -hmm. right? That regulates basically, you know, what you can, you cannot do. And so I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, the, our guests here know, but I don't know if they, um, they, they talk about contamination uh, as well. But it looks like, I mean, I, I assume there is something at that level where we all yes, should talk the about, treaty. right? There is well, a treaty. On yeah, a related note, but not quite the same, a lot of people are worried about just space debris in general or above, above the Earth, and people are just launching whatever they want up there, and, you know, there's all there's a lot of concern now about controlling basically the litter, you know, that, that's up there, and we can't even, we don't even really have an agreement on that yet, so I think that, you know, the, uh, to extending this to other planets and moons might be uh, way more problematic. Um, and Margaret, I just pasted that in the chat, says over 100 nations have signed the Outer Space Treaty and, and agreed to abide by planetary protection guidelines. China, China is one of the signatories. Wonderful. So there are, at least oh, yeah. people are laying the groundwork and private industry is, I don't know if they're bound to it or not, but hopefully they're at least going to, you know, uh, uh, try to do it because it says, as Betty is reminding us, there's no police out there um, to really make sure... Uh, that's uh, that's followed. J. Andy Spry, you're also commenting, Viking has strict sterilization requirements but found conditions to be severe. The conditions were therefore relaxed for Pathfinder in 96. Jen, do you have any comment based on your experience with curiosity about that? Is it um, is it better than it was in Viking's day? I mean, it wasn't as, was it too strict? 
I, I think, I mean, I think that that's absolutely right. <laughs> that comment is, is absolutely right. I don't know all the details, but I, I do know that Viking had, you know, they, Viking, the budget for Viking was huge, and they were able to do, you know, an amazing amount of sterilization and cleaning um, that we just don't do anymore. Okay. I mean, they were going in, and they had no idea what might be there, whether it was teeming with, with life or organics. And so they, you know, they had reason to prepare for absolutely anything. And now we have a, a bit of a better idea, at least, what the top couple of centimeters of, of Mars is like. Okay. Well, um, all right. Well, good. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm also looking through the comments as, as people are talking. So um, the... I, I want to extend just a little bit because you brought it up, Jan, at the beginning about Europa and some of the other uh, places that we want to look for life. When we go to send things out to these moons and other places where we expect there's a high possibility of life, uh, what do you does that add a lot of complexity to the mission and cost? And can you maybe give us an idea of what that might look like? Um, I can give you a general idea. Yeah, that's um, all we're after here. <laughs> I, mean, I know that these are targets of, of you know great interest because um, they they have frozen water and possibly uh, underneath the frozen water maybe liquid water. So of course this is uh, I mean this is the big the big problem and, and issue is the places that we want to go to look for life are by definition the easiest to contaminate. So I would imagine that these um, these places would have you know the utmost of of protection or sterilization and characterizing what you're bringing with you. Um, you know, I don't know the details of of future mission scenarios, but but yeah, I mean this is a big thing to think about, especially when you you imagine you've got a ball of of you know ice and liquid possibility of liquid water. Okay. Well, let me let me ask you guys. This is to either one of you, and you, I'd like you both to get your comments on this and get your feedback on it. But what do each of you see as the biggest challenges? What's the hardest problems associated with uh, protecting these planets? And uh, uh, Betty, I'll start with you. What do you see as the biggest challenges? Uh, well, I think there's. A lot, I would I would maybe put it differently from my okay. point of view. Right now, we have these gaps of knowledge that we need mm -hmm. to address. And for me, the biggest one might be the transport issue. Can microbes, if we brought them to Mars, can they live there? Is the radiation environment and the other conditions so extreme that they couldn't? And so there are studies that I would still like us to see that we could do, such as sim use the Martian soil, simulant of the Martian soil, simulant of the, of the radiation environment, and study can um, microbes or bacteria that we have on Earth, could they survive? So are there such studies? Actually, I wanted to ask this for the whole hangout, but oh well, so I, go ahead, Alberto. Yeah, are there? Are there are, so are, are there folks actually doing this, doing exactly this? Because you can imagine that that's uh, that's one of the most important questions, as you mentioned, right, Betty? I don't know that anyone's doing it yet, but it is a question that I think that we will be soliciting research for because it is one of the key questions. Then we may not have to worry so much, or maybe we do have to worry, right. but it would give us some answers, and I think. That was the, the workshop that we ran was what is a high priority research questions that we want to address and that was one of them. Okay. Jen, do you have any comments on the challenges, the things that you think are particularly difficult about this problem? Um, well, I mentioned it before, but I think because the places that are the best to look for life are also the places that we have to be most <laughs> careful about um, you know, encountering, um, that makes it difficult. Um, and in addition to that, um, I would say, you know, there's a couple of things. Um, the instruments that we have now that we send to these planets, some of them are so sensitive and, um, you know, they can detect, like, really small amounts of stuff. And so if you have even a small amount of contamination, um, you know, not, not biological contamination, but say just hydrocarbons or, you know, something, you can detect that. So we're so sensitive that we can detect everything. So you really have to um, you have to go to great lengths mm. to pull out what's Martian from you know your background contamination, and it's something we can do. But as instruments get more and more sensitive, it becomes I mean you know it's a, a blessing and a curse kind of thing. Okay, good. Well, uh, the 
the uh, George Caldwell is asking a really good question. The moon has been suggested as a test bed for planetary protection for human missions in space. Uh, would this be economically viable? And and are we are there any plans? Do you guys know of doing using the moon for this as kind of a test bed? Presumably, it's one of those places Jen's not worried about finding life, right? I mean, we don't know, but <laughs> any plans for that? Anyone? Do we know about? I guess not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's really tough to see since the lunar surface is so different from the Martian surface, and of course, uh, the moon has no atmosphere. A completely different history. It's tough to know how you would use the moon as a demo or a precursor site or a test site. Probably a whole lot less relevant compared to what you could do in a laboratory on Earth. All right. Well, let me so let me just expand that just a little bit and go to the International Space Station and do it. Or are we doing any research on the along this line up there? So on the space station, there are some studies that we're looking at. We're looking at the vents. What might you know? Are there microbes that are vented out? And we're looking at the spacesuits. What are we are leaking? And so there are things that, there. We also look at what microbes can survive um, within the space station and outside of it. All right. Well, there you go. So all right, I, I'm just doing another quick look here. Um, Actually, uh, do we know that there are not? microbes outside the space station growing? Some kind, of, what, some kind of green slime? Is that what you're I don't know. About? Do we know that? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, wait, do, I, mean, I, guess, I mean, I don't know. Do we have a sensors, I guess, that tell us if there's something? I, I don't know. I'm asking a silly question. I but. think there's studies currently going on to, to look at that. I don't know that we have the answer right now. Okay. Right. okay. Well, George Call, or Jay Allen, or Andy Spry has, has made an interesting comment in the chat that I want to kind of get into. He goes, Galileo was forbidden, the Galileo probe, not the person, uh, <laughs> from accidentally crashing into Europa and got lots of data on the way in. Now, I don't know what the penalty would have been if it did accidentally crash into Europa, but let's say, is that true, though? Do you guys know that, that were there protocols in place to prevent any interference with uh, from the Galileo probe around Jupiter? Does anybody know? No? Well, when, um, when Jen was talking about the categories of missions, that is one of them, that you're supposed to reduce the possibility of crashing into... Oh, a body that you think there might possibly be life. Okay, very good. Because that would contaminate it, obviously. Right, exactly. Actually, so. which brings up a question, Betty. Does such a comparable parallel protocol apply to bringing samples back to the Earth that there has to be protocols in place so that if you lose uh, absolute lock on the, on the vehicle, on the return vehicle, it will not crash into the Earth? Um, obviously, we want to do the same, yes. It's a little harder because you want it to return it to the Earth, so the trajectory is really onto the Earth, right? Well, no, 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 no. that's what I said. If, if it's, if, I know, I'm, if you, I, I you realize that you, don't, you no longer have absolute control of it, that it defaults to missing the Earth. But what about, remember there was this mission called, I think it was called, was it called Stardust? That had yep. a simple return from a comment and that yep. actually didn't go too well, right? No, that uh, one, that one went, that one did. Which ones? Wasn't there one where the, where the return, the, the, the return sample yeah, crashed yeah. or something? It embedded itself in a dry or semi-dry lake bed in, in Utah. Well, yeah, I think, I, that. I mean, Stardust, was not did, Stardust. Stardust yeah. did land there, and it, but it was, you know, I mean, it was, Planned to keep everything was sort of kept in this cocoon of okay, okay. Uh, you know, and also no I, leakage, so to again speak. that was visiting the the tail of a comet. So again, when we consider you know where we're going, mm -hmm. we don't think that there's likely to be life in the tail of a comet. So it didn't necessarily have the kind of um, you know contamination and life detect like life issues. I'll just call them that. <laughs> we weren't yeah. worried about. Can, Picking up life at the tail of, of a comet and contaminating right, the of it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, we can all stop the Hangout now because uh, Yurik Mazino has, has basically already solved the problem. He says, just send Curiosity some baby wipes and rubbing alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically the, the solution to our problem right there. So. All right. Well, I, for one, am extremely happy this work is going on, and it's really good that uh, that um, that we're thinking about these problems. And as, and as uh, Betty has pointed out, there's a lot of people agreeing to certain protocols. Are still deciding a lot of this stuff with the uh, human uh, aspect of getting us uh, 
the, the human protocols. We've already been following a lot of the stuff that has to do with robotic probes and uh, and and non-human uh, devices that we send to other planets. So a lot of work is going on. A lot of people are are getting this getting this hopefully worked out for us. I'm kind of wishing that somebody comes up with some kind of police force to make sure <laughs> that we don't mess up these planets, but or that we don't, you know, litter them up. But uh, you know, give a hoot, don't pollute, folks. That's the that's right now. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, I really yeah. So I want to thank both of my guests, Dr. Betty Siegel from uh, NASA HQ. Thank you so much for taking time. Also, Jen Stern, both of you. Uh, this has been a really great discussion. I want to thank you both for for taking time out to share your knowledge. And we hope you'll come back as we get more of these uh, protocols developed and and more. Um, missions out there, so uh, I hope you guys will come back and let us know some more if there's further progress on all of this. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. And okay, I appreciate well, that you're getting the message out. It's very important. It is. I couldn't agree more. And Elon Musk, I'm glad you're paying attention. Don't go off. <laughs> don't go off by yourself without paying attention to these protocols. So the moral right. of the story is actually you should take care of this planet, but also every other planet. Of course. Well, we should start at home. Exactly. That's great advice. Thank you. On that note, we will call this hangout over. But before we do, this is a monthly hangout where each each Friday, I should have said this at the top, on uh, the first Friday of every month, we do these hangouts. Footsteps to Mars. Thank you all for for uh, for watching this live. Harley, do we have a sense of what's coming up, or do we yeah, not we, know yet? We do. You mentioned at the beginning that there is in two weeks going to be this important Humans to Mars Summit. Folks can find out about it by by uh, searching Humans to Mars Summit on the web. It'll be able to be folks will be able to watch it on the web, and we are going to have some of the speakers from the Humans to Mars Summit at probably, certainly at the next um, Hangout and probably for two more Hangouts. Great. Wow. All right. Humans to Mars is on the agenda, folks. So thank you all for watching. We hope you'll you'll check us out next next month, same time, same bat channel. No, same Mars channel. That's what it's <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> Alberto and Harley, thank you both very much. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for showing up again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, oh, Tony. And Alberto. Yes. Keep thanks. Keep us. Keep get us some of those uh, JWST clocks. <laughs> and, it's a long story. You know, contaminating the L2 point with uh, JWST. Exactly. It's a long story. Yes. Yeah, it's a okay. long story. I don't. <laughs> sounds like a topic for another hangout. All right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, folks. JWS, JWST swag. <laughs> no, actually, I wish it's actually you can buy. You you should be able to. You were able to buy this. Is Lego at IKEA? I just painted it gold, but they don't make this clock anymore. Oh, so I got the last two or something. I got one here, and the other one I gave to Scott Willoughby, a program manager at Northrop Grumman. And then I went back to buy like ten, and they were they don't make them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Darn you, IKEA! All right, well, exactly. All right, well, thank you guys. Maybe there'll be a maybe there'll be a uh, JWST coffee table next. Maybe that's what <laughs> yeah. that would be. That'd be cool. All right, folks. Thank you all for watching, and uh, we'll see you guys next month. And as always, keep looking up. Thank you.